So I'm already prepared here and started recording for YouTube as well. It's a pleasure to have everybody here again. And uh, again, as I, I said, uh, so I'm already prepared here and started recording for YouTube as well. It's a pleasure to have everybody here. And the good thing is that uh, we can interact. The good thing of, of uh, uh, these, uh, you know, teachings and uh, relationships is that we can relate, talk and discuss whatever we do the same or different. And this is, uh, for me, of utmost importance. Uh, and uh, it's been a while I'm involved in uh, vitro retinal surgery. And a uh, short history is that uh, when I, I went to Toronto, Canada for my retinal fellowship over there, I had already uh, done a uh, retinal fellowship here in, in Goiânia, Brazil. And uh, that was a long time ago, 1997. And uh, before 1997, I was visiting there as an um, observer before I got my retinal fellowship. And the uh, interesting is that by that time, uh, we still did uh, the uh, Lander system, not the wide angle system. And uh, the wide angle system was taking off. This is interesting how things uh, had an evolution over time. You know, today we have uh, the small gauge surgery. It's, it's much better. This for me is the, the best thing and uh, uh, technical maneuvers and uh, new instruments. So it's, it's good to be uh, in a retinal fellowship involved on it with you and uh, with the residents uh, these times as compared to times before we have so much to add and uh, to participate and uh, to to be part of that uh, we uh, we feel very honor honored for that and also new equipment new instruments new uh, OCTs machines we started with uh, you know RTA SLOs now we have good OCTs better OCTs and uh, this is uh, this is great for us and uh, Jadip, should I start our our talk? Oh yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Uh, hi, Ashwara. You are okay. Everything is all right. And uh, there is somebody new today, uh, Manasa uh, Benumecha. How are you? Yes, sir. I'm good, sir. I'm good, sir. You are from Aditya? Hello? Aditya Jai. No, sir. I am, I, I am from Vision Care uh, Center for Retina, working under Dr. Nagesh Rao. Oh, yeah. Hi, Nagesh. Yeah. Good case you put us to discuss. So let's go search for the uh, lab examination, exams and uh, try to find the correct diagnosis. A very interesting case. We should put more cases like that. I was uh, in Brasilia yesterday and I saw interesting uh, well, I was in Brasilia yesterday as I said and uh, we saw very interesting cases I should start putting those cases uh, this week but uh, I'm a little uh, concerned and uh, we are quite busy for uh, next Saturday we are going to have the uh, retinalsome in which you, you are going to participate and uh, thank you for sending me your video and uh, we are happy for that also Saturday we have all the other meetings and uh, online it's a meeting from Cordoba Argentina as well which is going to be displayed we just uh, sent the videos and they're going to be displaying our videos there and the uh, retinalsome will be cool and uh, I hope you guys are participating. And uh, just before I start, I will just uh, 
show my small a small presentation here for our retinosome. Also, Natarajan will be there. It's uh, always an honor for us. And uh, Natarajan started this thing too, and uh, he is one of the uh, founders. And uh, let me share the screen over here, I guess. Uh, can you? Can you see my share or my my screen now? I guess so. So I will share this uh, right now something. Just a sec. Yeah, I think the screen is enlarged now. We are getting used to this uh, Zoom. It, it's so good, you know, that we can share. And the good thing is that we have already 10 countries to participate. And uh, Nageswar and uh, Vibe have set it from, from uh, New Delhi is there too. And uh, Dr. Natarajan, that was, uh, was an honor for that. And uh, I have here my professor, uh, Rob Deveni. He's from Canada. He's one of the founders. Uh, he might not be able to participate, but he is always uh, there, you know, honor for us to have professors uh, like uh, Dr. Wai Chin Lam from Toronto, where we did our retinal fellowship as well, and uh, friends like uh, Yuzuki Oshima and uh, Lawrence Chong is going to be uh, the uh, keynote speakers, and everybody else here is though they are very close friends, and uh, uh, it's uh, we are always honored for that. So I will start. My presentation, can you see uh, the uh, keynote presentation? <coughs> I will mix, I'm gonna mix the uh, presentation with uh, the apparatal membrane subject. And uh, on the way, uh, we are gonna uh, uh, go with a short review of uh, the apparatal membranes, but also we are going to show you guys uh, whatever we do, uh, what is our uh, preference, whatever we should, we go and do maybe different on the subject. So let me grab the uh, keynote here and uh, play slideshow so everybody can see the, uh, the screen. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Can you see an aggressive war? Yes, yes, I can see. Deep. Okay, so let, let us talk about epiretinal membranes and uh, uh, a quick review for epiretinal membranes is that, uh, <laughs> let me just uh, roll over this, just a second, make it a little smaller, and uh, okay. The, a quick resume of the uh, concept of uh, epiretinal membranes, uh, cellular proliferation in the inner retinal surface. And uh, we have uh, other names for it, such as uh, premacular fibroplasia, macular pucker, uh, cellophane retinopathy, uh, premacular gliosis. This is uh, just the way people know the retinal membranes uh, concept. And uh, uh, we st started you know, years ago with uh, studies like the Beaver DMI study and the Blue Mountains Eye study. But of course, today you see lots of more studies on that. And uh, uh, they were looking at the overall prevalence of retinal membranes in these populations, uh, accounting for 7 to 11.8% in the year incidence 
yearly of 5.3%. Uh, and the uh, bilaterality of uh, parietal membranes were 19 to 31%, and uh, with a 13.5% five-year incidence of a second eye involved. So it's uh, pretty common, and uh, we should always look at uh, the other patient's eye as well. So age distribution, the, we have variation, variations among uh, different populations, and uh, the peak is between ages of 70 to 79, uh, could be less, could be more, depending on those uh, uh, populations. And uh, in the uh, beaver dam study, epiretinal uh, uh, membranes were more commonly diagnosed in women uh, at that study, but uh, not in the Blue Mountain studies. And uh, this could be uh, merely due to greater survival rate of women in this age group. So that's uh, just to show that that uh, uh, could be different in uh, one or other population, as we mentioned. Um, the prevalence of epiretinal membrane appears to vary with ethnicity, and uh, interesting in that uh, we have a higher prevalence in Chinese participants as compared to Caucas Cauc Caucasians, and the lower rates observed in Japanese. In the Blue Mountain study, the prevalence of epiretinal membrane was increased following cataract surgery, 16.8%, and uh, retinal vein occlusions. And uh, when we talk about uh, epiretinal membranes, you're gonna see we have the differentiation between the uh, primary and the secondary epiretinal membranes. All these things account for different statistics. And uh, uh, we uh, know that, uh, as I said, that is idiopathic. You don't find uh, a good reason for the uh, uh, epiretinal membrane to be there or associated ocular diseases and uh, secondary in, in a pre existing or a pre existing condition has a significant impact in development. And the iatrogenic, you see with uh, uh, surgeries with uh, excessive lasers, for example, with uh, not dealing so well with PVRs. And so you could uh, do a very extensive uh, retinotomy, for example, in a place where it shouldn't be. And uh, so all these things could, uh, even the laser in the office in an excessive way could uh, account for uh, uh, epiretinal membranes. And uh, as I said, idiopathic and uh, lots of causes for the secondary causes of epiretinal membranes, as you see here, uh, retinal vascular diseases, uh, uh, vascular occlusions, uh, diabetic retinopathy, very common, telangiectasis, microaneurysm, sickle cell retinopathy, intraocular inflammation, trauma, retinal detachment, and the retinal tears, intraocular tumors, uh, retinal angiomas, hematomas, retinal dystrophies, and uh, retinitis pigmentosus among others, many others. And uh, uh, I have here, just to take off, uh, some videos of mine that uh, we published out of YouTube. And uh, I separated uh, six videos, but I'm not gonna play the videos uh, totally, but just uh, some parts to show uh, what is interesting that we have here. Uh, TOT epiretinal membrane IL, uh, ILM peel technique. So that comes to the concern whether we should do the two surgeries er, at a time or we should just uh, do one and uh, for whatever reason and uh, why, why we would be doing that. As you see here, the OCT, it's a total epiretinal membrane. Interesting to see is when we have an epiretinal membrane that might be very adherent or not. In uh, such a case like this, you have the, uh, the membrane uh, very attached, very adherent that uh, could make uh, things uh, a little more 
more difficult. But it's good that we have uh, the OCT so that we take a very good look, look at their structure. As you see here, the OCT and uh, you see the area of the apparatum brain brain in distortions, especially in those areas we have to be very careful with the distortions at uh, the IZ, EZ zones. And the good thing is that I'm showing here autofluorescence. Autofluorescence shows, especially where uh, whether the membrane is deeply rooted in the into the retina. That is a very important information. If you could always use uh, autofluorescence. And as you see here, the OCT. So how the apparatal membranes leaves the retina so irregular. And then uh, we are carrying on with uh, inverted uh, contact lens. And uh, we are using brilliant blue. Interesting to uh, compare. So the thing is, where should we grab the apparatal membrane where, when it's so taut and so adherent? So you should find the correct place. The good thing is that we rely also on dyes, so we could stain well the ILM. And uh, when we see the ILM, it's possible to see the apparatal membrane by contrast. Uh, times ago, people said, no, they are... Uh, ILM, you can only see the ILM, you cannot see the apparatal membrane, but by contrast, you see them both. It's, it's very interesting. So in this way, we are removing the uh, internal limiting membrane, but beforehand, we removed the uh, apparatal membrane. And so we uh, removed both at a time. And so here, you see here the comparison with uh, the uh, autofluorescence, so as to help you decide where to go. It's always good to have them both. As you see here, and so why is it important to remove the ILM together with the apparatal membrane in some, not all, uh, very taut and tough cases? Because uh, you see by the OCT, you see the uh, apparatal membrane, but it's so adherent, and sometimes you have defects on the ILM, and uh, from these defects, you have the Miller cells and uh, growing through these defects and uh, creating scaffold on the retinal surface, thus increasing the likelihood of uh, worsening the apparatal membrane. So that's one of the reasons why some people also do retinal detachment surgery and uh, to avoid these uh, PVRs, they also remove the uh, internal limiting membrane. So it's what we call uh, the double peel. We end this case with uh, endo laser and uh, air fluid exchange as well. You see here, as you see on, on the OCT picture on the middle, uh, you see uh, the apparatal membrane. You see, but it's so adherent. And uh, when you have a secondary apparatal membrane, sometimes you have focal adhesions at the retinal surface, on the retinal surface. But in this case, it, uh, uh, because it's uh, primary, so it keeps uh, uh, parallel, and uh, you don't see this uh, PVD, you don't see vitro macular attraction. So uh, you gotta uh, grab it, and sometimes it's difficult to remove it uh, without 
uh, having to remove the ILM. In this case, we decided to remove the ILM, and so we removed the apparatal membrane as well. As you see, this is a very uh, beautiful picture. That's we call what we call the uh, the double pill. So this was uh, the first uh, example, and uh, we go on uh, with the uh, classification and uh, from uh, the basics, as I said, to the advanced. So uh, as a guest described the disease, grade zero, cellophone maculopathy, these are usually asymptomatic membranes and uh, could be incidental uh, finding in the retinal examination. So you see different colors. Uh, you should look uh, both eyes and you see this uh, uh, shiny reflex. We usually call it cellophone maculopathy. And uh, when you have some wrinkling at the macular surface, and then uh, comes to a stage one, the uh, image, uh, the patient starts to complain of distorted of blurred vision as well. And uh, all the symptoms uh, that could uh, happen rarely could be uh, uh, center of autopsia, macropsia, monocular, diplopia, uh, and uh, you should look at two eyes. And uh, monocular diplopia, that means that uh, uh, if you uh, are uh, cover one eye and uh, the one eye has uh, the other eye has a retinal membrane, you could see uh, double out of this eye. So binocular binocular diplopia would be you are seeing double, but with uh, both eyes wide open. In this case, if you have uh, a retinal membrane and uh, you want to test the eye with a retinal membrane, you cover the fellow eye, and uh, this eye with a retinal membrane, you, you, you could see uh, double. It's interesting to, to see that. And uh, another example of uh, uh, grade one, that's, that's vision, as you see here on the uh, his, uh, right eye, involving the vessel as well. So you've got to be very careful whether the membrane could involve not only the macular area, but uh, distort the ves vessels and uh, other structures. As you, you see here in stage two, this is uh, pretty, pretty involving in the macular surface. So uh, approximately 80% of these patients with grade two aporetinal membranes have symptoms of blurred vision and the metamorphopsia. It's uh, more difficult to deal with. In these cases, uh, you should go ahead and uh, test uh, whether the patient needs surgery. Of course, it's a little late because you could have developed uh, more uh, symptoms and uh, you could have developed uh, or vascular uh, structural uh, lesions because you have uh, the membrane causing this attraction over the macular area. And now I move it on to another uh, sorry, video here. It's in the number two. I'll go fast with the videos and they're just showing whatever is more, more interesting, more important. This is another uh, inverted surgery. This is uh, Goiania, our city. And uh, what to do with uh, uh, surgery uh, early or surgery later. And uh, I'll go back to the uh, title here. Early ILM PO for full thickness macular hole. Just to show that uh, you have here this uh, This patient was cool, you know. He just had this uh, vitro, vitro extraction, and uh, the vision was 2030, and the patient had his vision worse. But the thing is that uh, he had the PVD. The PVD, when, whenever we see patients uh, with uh, macular holes, and uh, we not only look at uh, uh, aporetinal membranes, but we look at the uh, posterior vitreous. This video is to show whether the vitreous is, is important because oftentimes you don't have a PVD, you don't have a posterior vitreous detachment, but you could have this uh, vitromacular traction, but not in this case. The vitreous was just uh, pulling away 
and uh, when you have the vitreous, uh, the loose vitreous, and uh, it uh, escapes from the uh, retinal surface, it could cause a macular hole. In those cases, we always look at the other eye. If the other eye has a posterior vitreous detachment, the likelihood of having a uh, macular hole is, uh, is much less. This is not uh, the subject for today, but I just want to show whether we should compare, you know, these patients before. And so just observing when the vitreous attachments were there and after the vitreous attachments uh, were uh, out of the retinal surface, and then you had this, uh, uh, in the field time, you had this macular hole and cyst and structural changes. All these things you might be able to see in the aporetinal membranes as well. And uh, important, as I showed the last case of appearing uh, the ILM, in this case we did not have much aporetinal membrane, but just to show uh, how it's important to uh, peel the ILM with a good dye, with a good green and blue uh, technique. So we go back to the, uh, the slides, and uh, we have here, uh, as I said, a PVD. A PVD is uh, present in approximately 60 to 90 percent of patients at the time of diagnosis. And uh, if patient uh, has a, a partial PVD and a persistent vitro macular adhesion, they are more likely to develop CME and uh, lower visual acuity. So uh, in cases where PVD does not exist, and uh, uh, you could see uh, some uh, distortions from the vitro macular traction over the retinal surface. And uh, this shows at the uh, image on the top, you see these uh, microaneurysm, the image, uh, and some hemorrhage as well, the arrow, the, the arrow in the bottom showing. And uh, you see uh, at the bottom image, a spontaneous evolution of uh, the vitreous. And this uh, could uh, uh, sometimes uh, also remove the aporetinal membrane and uh, cause a cure for the aporetinal membrane and the patient uh, could not need a surgery. This is interesting. It is not so uncommon to see spontaneous avulsion of the aporetinal membrane as you see in the picture. So you always have to observe and uh, ask for the patient's symptoms. Uh, the patient could be scheduled for surgery today, but yesterday he had these symptoms, and uh, I had canceled some cases where the patient knew my vision so much good. So it, it's, it happens with a vitreous hemorrhage, for example. You're waiting for a vitrectomy, the patient had, uh, uh, has a diabetic retinopathy with vitreous hemorrhage, and the other day you are going to be operating uh, some maybe uh, three or uh, one month, three weeks or a month later, the patient said, no, my vision is so much good. So you, you are taking a look, you don't see vitreous hemorrhage as well. So this, that could happen because the aporetinal membrane was attached and now it's not attached anymore. And uh, so that happens and there uh, could be a spontaneous avulsion. And uh, as you see here, the structural changes that you see when you have these aporetinal membranes so attached, you see on the uh, left image, you see uh, the color peak showing the macular involvement. In the mid middle picture, you see uh, the lining of the retinal membrane full thickness, and you see cysts on the right uh, image, intraretinal cysts, and the changes as well. You could have uh, macular pseudo holes, lamellar holes, and uh, also, that could involve with a macular hole as well. So, uh, usually, you see uh, in this image, you see uh, pseudo holes. And uh, that could, uh, uh, in general, these uh, aporetinal membranes don't get worse over time. But if you have a cutoff for operating patients with uh, 20, 60 or less, we could be uh, having a, a better prognosis 
as of to wait until the uh, vision gets uh, blurred and uh, you could possibly be happy with a vision of uh, 2000, but it is not good anyways. So I tend to operate in my experience in patients with uh, 2050 or less, even 2040, when you see the OCT and you have attraction, and I tend to operate a lot earlier. And uh, uh, you have here in the image, in, the, in red, you have uh, an epiretinal membrane with uh, PVR. You see lots of more RPE pigmented cells as opposed to the bluish image on the right side where you see uh, primary epiretinal membrane and uh, you see it more uh, as a line. So uh, there are uh, some uh, causes for that and uh, you should be looking at uh, the extension of these uh, causes and the involvement in the macular area. So you gotta be a lot more careful when uh, operating on AI with uh, PVR and the apparatus membrane because uh, that might be connecting uh, cells, uh, RPE, vessels, so it's a lot worse. And uh, they are more heavily pigmented uh, melanin and uh, you have uh, the possibility of retinal ischemia and neovascular proliferations and uh, have a major vascular components as well. And uh, that could be an evidence that epiretinal membrane formation represents a reactive glio gliosis in response to retinal injury or disease involving inflammatory and glial cells as well. And uh, we have here the uh, uh, growth factors that could be involved. This is a picture from the Ryan book, update the Ryan book. So you have growth factors that could be involved in the formation of retinal membranes. There are lots of them. We not always look uh, for them, but uh, it's good to know that they, they exist, they are there. We should always uh, take them into uh, considerations. And uh, you know that the milieu cells uh, occupies and go all over the retina. As I said in slides before, that uh, uh, the milieu cell could uh, well uh, find uh, defects in the internal limiting membranes, superficial surface uh, defects, and that could uh, grow uh, towards the ILM and create that scaffold and uh, contribute for, for, for the formation of the apparatus membrane. That's why, as I said in slides before, that we should think in some cases of doing the apparatus membrane surgery also after retinal detachment surgery and even considering uh, pitting the uh, ILM for retinal detachments and PVR cases. So you see that uh, the response of Miller cells and other cells that go through all over the retina, they could uh, create the scaffold and cause the worsening of the case and the redetachments and things. So uh, as you see here, activation of Miller cells may continue even once the original stimulus has been withdrawn, as I said, in the retinal detachment surgery. Even though you did a very good uh, retinal detachment surgery, you could all uh, still have uh, the amelia cells activation because they migrate through the ILM and then the case could worsen. And so you have all these structures, not only the amelia cells, but uh, you have uh, nervous interneurons layer, synaptic layer, photoreceptor layer. We have, have always to uh, take a very good look at the uh, uh, auto retina because if you have a very uh, important uh, traction in the retina surface that might uh, influence the outer retina uh, areas and uh, with the uh, contractive actin and myofibroblasts as well and the membranes and uh, these could distort the retinal vasculature with or without breaks and that could break the uh, blood retinal barrier as well. 
So we always be very careful. And you see on the OCT on the left, you see the this is still an apparatal membrane. Not very easy to catch. Uh, you might well lose it, but you see that the foveal contour, the foveal shape is not there anymore. And you see the lining in, uh, on red. You see that the apparatal membrane is there. This is, uh, that could be classified as a, a, a taut one, but then you should go after the, uh, the membrane during surgery and then remove it. You see a better uh, apparatal membrane, better, but it's not good. But uh, on the right, you see the easy to catch, easier to catch the apparatal membrane. On the right side, is still with uh, distortion of the uh, uh, foveal area and shape. And uh, you have the OCT down to, to show the uh, normal RPE shape. And uh, uh, if you have the SDOCT, as the, we discussed in previous lectures, it's better that you have the spectral domain OCT uh, as opposed to the time domain and other, other machines that uh, you should uh, look at uh, uh, the ISOS junction disruption and uh, thickening of the central macular and other uh, areas. And it's interesting that Oster that all found that the ISOS junction was a more useful predictor of visual acuity when compared with central macular thickness. When you have the apparatal membrane just pulling on the retinal surface and you have uh, the uh, uh, macular thickness in increase, the central macular thickness as we see C CMT, and uh, it's not as important as you have the distortion of the ISOS junction, the area of the photoreceptors there. So you have to uh, you need to have a very good OCT to take a look on these, uh, these changes because uh, the case, the visual acuity could be getting worse but could not take too long to get worse uh, if you have this uh, involvement of, of ISOS junctions as uh, the central macular thickness could, could wait a little more until you treat the apparatal membrane. Now I have here another another case. Uh, let me go here. The triple peel. I think I mentioned I showed this case in any other opportunities. So the decisions is that you have three things going on at the same time. You have here an apparatal membrane, you have the PVD, and you also have the uh, internal limiting membrane. All taking account for this image here. You see, you, s you have a vitro macro traction, very important over the retinal area. You can see on the left bottom image, you see the lining of the uh, apparatal membrane, and you see distortions in the easy, IZ zones and uh, foveal area, you don't see the foveal shape anymore as you see you follow uh, with the OCT uh, above. So difficult, difficult case to deal with. And uh, retinal uh, thickening as well. You see, if you go only here, you see, okay, it's uh, just a... Uh, uh, if, if you have only this image, this is just an uh, apparatal membrane, so we go uh, for the surgery. But if you keep going with the OCT, you're going to see how severe it is. And so the thing from my ex experience, this patient is fake, is that you should always operate on this patient. After I did the core vitrectomy, I, I'm here with the macular lens because the macular lens uh, makes you see the reflex and you see all membranes. I'm grabbing here now with the macular lens, I'm grabbing the ad adherent, very adherent uh, hyaloid there. I still go around the macula 
And I, I got to be very careful at, uh, at this time because I remember from the OCT, if I pull it too forcefully, I'm going to open up a, a hole over there. And so I have to be extra careful here. Now I go horizontal. I don't pull vertically. This is what I call the first peel. So you're peeling the hyaloid, but you're very slow and going horizontally. This is a normal pace. Very slow, very slow to detach it. And when you detach it, you search for the hyaloid, you lift it up, and they remove it from, off, uh, from the uh, macular area. So that was the first membrane to be removed. And now I will uh, go towards the second pew. The second pew is the upper retinal membrane that was lifted up when we removed the hyaloid. And now I'm removing down below the upper retinal membrane. You see that the cutter is flush uh, on the retinal surface, not touching it. You gotta be very careful. You, bear, you gotta be superficial with a high speed cut and uh, not very much uh, aspiration, and don't go vertical up. Otherwise, you may tear uh, and cause a hole in the retinal surface. And after I removed these uh, two membranes that I called membrane, the first, the PVD, is, uh, the hyaloid uh, is not a, a membrane, it's a vitros uh, and uh, hyaloid, so, but I, I called, in this case, uh, the first pill, and then I removed the uh, apparatus membrane, and uh, because you have so much uh, distortion in the macular surface there, you see the macular, their fovea is still distorted. So I decided to do the third pew, which is the uh, ILM pew, to uh, get uh, the fovea area more stable. So before doing that, I'm carrying on with uh, an effluid exchange. And uh, after fluid exchange, I will uh, forward a little bit so I will go on with uh, Brilliant Blue. I, I love to use uh, Brilliant Blue. Of course, when I uh, stain with the Brilliant Blue, immediately after staining, I uh, turn on the diffusion line again, and uh, I don't leave the Brilliant Blue for long, maybe one minute there, and then I go on with uh, uh, vitrectomy to remove the excessive Brilliant Blue. Now I'm getting the uh, internal limiting membrane. But you see that the stations are getting more stable now. And uh, you should have a, a very good macular lens. If you have a very good macular lens, and then everything is so, so good to do, you stop and go, it's like watching a movie. You go, as I mentioned here, is, uh, it looks like a capsule rexis. You go, if you bring here and there, you don't need, in these cases, uh, very adherent uh, ILMs, and uh, in cases such cases like that, you don't need to be fast. Go slow, take your pace, and uh, you're going to be removing all tractions, and uh, it's, uh, it's pretty sure that uh, the case is going to be okay. And so I will forward a little bit. I'm still removing the ILM over here. And uh, I'll be doing this uh, uh, effluid exchange. And uh, as you see, the distortion is disappeared. It's a lot better. You see, you remember the autofluorescence from the beginning of this case. It's completely different. You don't see the distortion anymore, the rooted membranes. All membranes are deep, uh, were deeply rooted in the macro area. So this is a lot better now, a lot better. And uh, the patient's visual quality got better. You do, don't see the edema anymore, the tractants. And if you compare the two OCTs up and down before and after surgery, you see the resolution, still some edema, of course, because this was taken one month out, one month later after surgery. But uh, you see that the case is getting better. And if it necessary, if necessary, this case is going to be referred for injection as well. So we are coming to the end here. And uh, so always look at the uh, uh, easy uh, areas and uh, to look at uh, integrity 
of these areas, and I have a good OCT to look at of, uh, uh, for distortions, uh, the presence of the easy zone or absence, and uh, uh, this is important to uh, to try to catch uh, all, all changes before in, in the surgery and also giving you uh, an update on the possibility of better visual acuity and uh, where, when you start the surgery and not to take too long. And uh, as you see here, the central foveal thickness and you see uh, here uh, the cone outer segment. Uh, this is important to see these areas and you see the uh, central foveal thickness as well but the area of the cost, the area of the uh, cone outer segment uh, areas, you have to take a very good look at it because this distortion might cost you a good or a bad case in case you have too much distortions uh, of the uh, cost area, the, con the cones, and as compared to the central foveal thickness that could uh, stand a little longer with the uh, uh, central foveal thickness a little uh, wider, but uh, the cost uh, area from the, uh, the cons, outer segments, that could cost you a good or a, a better uh, outcome. And uh, the IS-OS junction appears to be disrupted during the early stages of apparatal membrane. So you should catch these apparatal membranes very early you don't go only for the visual acuity. You know, the visual acuity is okay, so I won't operate. I will just wait a little longer. But uh, if it goes uh, from uh, the classification from zero towards three, and then you have a significantly higher incidence of IS-OS disruptions there. So you you got to take a very good look at those uh, structures there, uh, thinking that uh, you have the whole structure, the overall structure, that uh, plays uh, account of uh, takes account of the the membranes. Also, don't forget the FA. FA is important, as you see here, vascular distortions, and you see edema, you see tractions, and you see straightening of the retinal vessels. And the autofluorescence, as I said, is good. That uh, sometimes you have ghost vessels, and uh, meaning that the vessels move with the traction and uh, you have printings, and you have changes, and uh, you, have, uh, you, you remember the last case I just showed you, you have these uh, apparatal membranes uh, before uh, deeply rooted with the OCT autofluorescence, and auto, uh, I mean the autofluorescence, and then yeah, I showed you after uh, the case, the postoperative autofluorescence, it was completely different. And uh, so, uh, talking about uh, surgical techniques, these are the techniques I, I use. Vital dyes, I like using uh, the brilliant blue. I'm used to that. I think you've you got to be using whatever is good for you, but some countries don't allow, allow you to have the uh, brilliant blue. For example, Dr. Wai Ching Lam, my professor Wai Ching Lam, was uh, saying that uh, in Hong Kong, and uh, they cannot use brilliant blue, but they have to rely on... Uh, uh, very diluted uh, uh, triple, triple blue, the same for the cataract, but doesn't uh, stain as well, but it's still is possible to do the surgery. Surgery, if you have a good macular lens, you've got to have a very good macular lens. Engaging techniques, as I showed you the cases, you, uh, if you have an OCT before the surgery, you take it to the OR and you know where the membrane is more adherent or where the membrane is uh, less adherent. You go after the membrane exactly where you want to be and uh, where you know whether it's more detached or not. If you have the possibility of doing OCT during the surgery, it's good to. Uh, some uh, microscopes have this. Uh, of course, it makes the surgery more, the OR more expensive, but it's a good thing. And... Uh, PVD induction. As I said, uh, you don't need only to induce PVD and pulling everything uh, away from the retina surface, otherwise it could cause problems and macular holes and other things that I mentioned. So be very careful when inducting uh, the PVD 
go slow, go your pace. And uh, if you want to use uh, dyes uh, uh, to better see the vitreous, for example, transinolone is good. Some people uh, use, I don't use that because uh, with my uh, macular lenses and uh, all their wide angle lenses, I uh, see well the vitreous, but uh, it, it's good if you, if you have and uh, you want to uh, use, but be very careful, especially for those uh, residents and uh, fellows that are starting. If you uh, use uh, uh, the transinolone, uh, you might engage uh, something uh, that is not vitreous, or you pull on the vitreous too forcefully and that create a hole and things, and uh, be very careful and go start core vitrectomy slow and then keep approaching towards the retinal surface. And uh, I think I showed uh, most of the cases here, and uh, most of what I do uh, different is uh, these are all from my eye tube. I, I like uh, doing double peel whenever it's necessary. For uh, toe tap retinal membranes, this is a very interesting case. I think it's my last case from uh, the uh, showing today. Uh, this is our inverted vitrectomy. That's uh, why I put this helicopter. So this is very tot ILM apparatus membrane, tot apparatus, and uh, I do here the. Uh, this is the one I showed. Yeah, just to show you again. As you see here, the uh, OCT, the fundus autofluorescence before, and as I showed at the end of the case, the fundus autofluorescence, it's completely different, completely different uh, uh, if you compare them, them both. So be, be careful not to do the uh, wrong approach. And uh, so surgical decisions, uh, they have to rely on uh, especially, I go down here, cost integrity, fundus autofluorescence, that could impact the outcomes. And uh, the integrity of the IS-OS junction is very important, that you take a very good look at the OCTs before the, the surgeries as well. And uh, that's about it. I, I think I, I, I rushed a little bit so that we could have uh, time for discussion. I will stop sharing now. And uh, that was quite a long time, you know, uh, probably 40, 45 minutes uh, speaking on the subject. It's so good, this subject, that I, I, I could have spread it here if we included macular holes, then could be another extra hour which is going to be for two weeks from now, you know, macular holes and uh, uh, techniques. But for epiretinal membranes, I think that uh, we should uh, always take a very good look at uh, the membrane before, later, uh, knowing the patient's history and uh, taking the good approach. And I will tell you, I, when I did my residency, my cutoff was 20 hundred. But today my graph is uh, 2040, even though the vision is good, but you see traction, you see the membrane, you see uh, uh, these changes, you should tell the patients, the family, that the patient might need the surgery before. And then what the point of uh, postponing the surgery if the patient is, get, the patient is getting worse? So you have to pay attention to those uh, things. Uh, thank you very much. J. Deep, do you have any, any comments? Yes. Professor J. Deep. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. It was an excellent presentation and wonderful videos. With, uh, good, great uh, description of the techniques. I, I think uh, I don't have anything much to add. I think what you said makes perfect sense. The only thing which I would say is about diagnosis. Maybe sometimes... Uh, there could be some membranes which are due to uh, inflammatory causes or sometimes you can misdiagnose it, uh, something like a combined hematoma uh, of the retina and RP 
which also looks like an epithelial membrane and you might you know in the especially in your early years you might say oh this is this looks like a very bad membrane let's take it out but the combined hematomas don't have very good prognosis if you operate them so some things like that you need to keep a close watch on whether you, what are you dealing with and as you said the ocd plays a very crucial role so we have to look at the ocd very carefully and the history and also uh, one thing which i would like to ask you is how how do you follow up these patients i mean uh, my threshold was to around say 618 or you can say a little more than 2040 but uh, yeah as you said there are certain characteristics which we need to look into when it comes to the ocd and also it's a little difficult to convince a patient with a relatively good vision to get operated so how how do you follow up these cases i, I follow you decide yeah i follow these cases uh i i like taking notes on all patients i take notes uh on the patients uh from the charts and so i have in my iphone that is connected with the uh, computer here with the mac i put the uh, patient's uh, number and uh, when the patient does ha- doesn't have a number which is not usually the case i have the date of birth birth and i keep following now you have now 2040 but this membrane is uh, very tiny so we should wait a little bit more so you should come in 3 months and i know he's going to come in 3 months when i want to know because we see so many patients at the abeng foundation it's like uh, having so many that i cannot remember all patients and i remember i have this patient i had this patient that had this uh, uh, good visual uh, uh, good prognosis good outcome and good visual acuity and so at the uh, top of my notes i write uh epiretinal membranes good outcome patients and uh good uh, this patient should be seen soon so i never lose the track of the patients and i also I always tell them that they have to come back and uh, i i have to tell you the 80% or more they all come back the patient that i showed the case we were uh, observing the, this patient he was uh, cool but uh, after 6 uh, months he developed this uh, uh, macular hole he had only a uh, detachment no epiretinal membranes but then he came and then we operated him right away so he didn't wait much time so i have this uh, system we have all patients in the chart in the computer in the system of the the program but i have them myself so uh, whenever i do surgery i wait for a bit for the uh, intraocular gas for example to come out of the eye and then i get the patient and uh, i do another OCT I do other surgeries uh, if necessary but usually I follow them with the OCT with the, if they are okay we just uh, keep following and uh, it's a good way to not to lose track of the patients and uh, I always talk to them because uh, most of my patients I see in the teaching basis unit in that Sai Bank Foundation so we are together with uh, residents and fellows we talk a lot uh with uh, to the patients we talk and explain this and that you know i had this patient that i saw a week ago that had uh, uh retinal detachment a traumatic retinal detachment surgery uh 2 years ago he was scheduled to remove the uh, silicon oil he had the silicon oil removed and then he developed this uh, retinal membrane he was scheduled to do the uh, retinal membrane peeling by the uh, end of the last year but then covid times came and uh, we could not do that and uh, he came complaining i'm very sorry i could not come because of covid times i had to travel uh, to see my family i had to stay there i could not leave and so the patients if you talk to them they they acquire this consciousness of the disease and uh, they see we are interested as well and that uh, we are uh, we really are and so i think jd the, the the best the best guess the best thing is to talk to our patient and uh, we we don't uh, 
yeah, miss those those cases. Right. Aishwara, did you like the uh, presentation? Nicole, Nicole is our retinal fellow. Let me ask Nicole or Carlos. Carlos Camera, are you still there or are you taking breakfast now? <laughs> uh, oh. is... oh. Carlos, good to see you. So you are going to the OR now? Could you repeat? You are going to the OR now, operating? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm waiting anesthetic. Okay, okay. Uh, Rodrigo, Ho Rodrigo, do you have anything to add? Hi, doctor. Uh, was a very good uh, presentation. No nope. Yeah, the, the good thing is, uh, as I said, J.Deep, I, I love these presentations because we talk, we discuss, and uh, uh, I don't know whether Nageswar, uh, he's probably started surgery. I know Nageswar starts... Yeah, he, he left, I think. He, he had oh, messaged yeah, yeah. Uh, in between that he has to leave. So one more thing which I wanted to ask is uh, uh, what, uh, what instruments are you using? Like, do you use... Uh, a pick or a kind of a spatula to lift the membrane first and then use a hand gripping forceps or you directly lift with the forcep? I, I usually... Or uh, do you do... use MVR sometimes to... No, I don't use MVR. Okay, Nick... No, I don't use MVR Sorry. blades anymore. I rarely use them 23 gauge with a, like a pick. So uh, yeah, as to yeah. lift the uh, membranes, but I'm very comfortable those days with the uh, good instruments we have, good rotation, good, you know, uh, cuts, 5,000 and uh, even more. I, 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 I'm very comfortable using the cutter itself after doing the core vitrectomy and uh, using the cutter to lift the, uh, the membranes and especially the hyaloid, because after you did the core vitrectomy and you, you don't have more attachments of the core vitreous on the retinal surface, so you look uh, for the, uh, the hyaloid. It is good where when he, uh, the hyaloid is already detached, it's easier. But if it's not, I always, I'll almost, always get the hyaloid from the nasal area, from... Uh, uh, from aspiration, not going straight towards the macula. And then I lift it up and I keep following the hyaloid just uh, parallel to the retinal surface. I go that way, uh, horizontal. That's why we need a macular lens to do that. I love lo doing that with the macular lens. I, don't, I, I use uh, the wide angle lens just for the core vitrectomy. And then after I do, did everything, peripheral vitrectomy, and then I go to, to do this work, I like using the macular lens because I see everything. I see, I detach the vitreous, yes. the nasal area, I lift it up, I, I keep following the, uh, the, the vitreous and uh, the adhesions and uh, the hyaloid and uh, keeping the safe distance from the macular surface. So I, I love using those instruments I, I use rarely. But today, I like the 23 gauge of the uh, cutter to do this stuff. And uh, it works well. As you saw in this triple peel uh, surgery, this is a very good example when we have all membranes there. And then we have, uh, I'm considering the hyaluron as a membrane, but uh, that's why I, I, I put it the name as the triple peel. But... Uh, it's it's good to do. Right? I have a video. It's interesting. I have a video for Terson syndrome in the eye tube. Terson syndrome, where I could with the cutter. Uh, you won't believe it. if you don't see it. You won't believe it. But uh, I could lift the internal limiting membrane up. I started with the cutter, and then 
I used the uh, back flush cannula. With the back flush cannula, I could lift the internal limiting membrane. Of course, with the uh, uh, pathology, with the, uh, the Tarsal syndrome, it was loose, the uh, internal limiting membrane. But yeah, there must be some ILM hemorrhage. So the ILM must be lifted up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we discussed the case uh, similar to that right. uh, some months ago. I've had uh, uh, similar cases, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I mentioned it to you, because I, I heard that from you. And then I could lift the uh, internal limiting membrane with the, the uh, back flush cannula. Take a look at the tube there. It's an intersal syndrome, uh, hudson Nakamura. It's right. interesting. You know, I had never done that before. <laughs> so it's still possible right. that it, the cutters and uh, if uh, the cutter gets safer and safer with uh, manufacturing and uh, if we have the opening, more close to the tip, it's better than if you have it uh, uh, more retracted. But sometimes if you have the opening of the cutter more retracted, not so much at the end, and then you, you, you could uh, have a safe distance, a safer distance. And uh, also uh, the ILM and the aparatal membrane forceps, I'm using them a lot and uh, I like those uh, from Catalyst, from Rumex, I use them all from, from Alcon, I, I use them all, but uh, uh, we, we are, you know, learning uh, different instruments and then working on trying to, to create, actually create other, other instruments uh, for better uh, pickup of the membranes and uh, uh, I don't use the, uh, but I think it could be a good, good thing to, to add. The, the loop, uh, some people uh, use the flex loop to lift up the, the membranes, but I prefer the pickup technique. <laughs> and, uh, okay. it's a you, you peel the ILM for all cases, sir? No, 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 not, not for all the cases, but we learned it from uh, many cases that oftentimes the Miller cells, they go uh, straight towards the defects from the ILM, the Miller cells, and uh, they create a scaffold for uh, epiretinal membrane. So in some cases, like PVR, some recurrent retinal detachments, and uh, I like doing the, uh, the surgery. After I attach the retina, I put PFC, and under PFC, after doing that fluid exchange with brilliant blue, under PFC, and then I peel the ILM because the uh, PFC keeps the retina down, so it doesn't lift. Yeah, right. Uh, some I, I in do. In RD that case, that's that's what I do. That's what I do when there's a detachment. If I have to peel the ILM, I do it under PFC. Yeah, I don't think we need to do to do the ILM peel for all cases, but uh, in some cases where the epiretinal membrane which is our uh, subject here, is very attached and adherent, and you cause the whole, the overall distortion. And then if you have the uh, ILM peeled, that happens. I mean, that helps, helps a lot to decrease the attractions, and the outcome gets better, and you have less chances of getting post-operative PVRs. When do you stay in such cases? Like, when do you put the brilliant loop? After removing the ERM or you do it in the beginning? No, at the beginning. Because uh, after vitrectomy, core vitrectomy, and peripheral vitrectomy, I do the fluid, air fluid exchange. I always do it complete, complete air fluid exchange. And when I put brilliant yes. blue, I, I stain ILM, I stain epiretinal membra membrane as well. Not so much intense as the ILM, but I always stain both. If you remove the hyaloid, you stain them both. So the case becomes a lot better if you see, you, you are seeing everything. And, uh, you know, uh, my last cases that I did, that I published on uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube, I always use the uh, brilliant blue. And uh, by doing double peel, with a double peel, you see the, the two membranes, you see the epiretinal and the, and the internal limiting, uh, both stained. Do you think, yeah, do you think when you peel out the epiretinal membrane after staining, does the 
ILM sometimes come out on its own under the ERM? No, not no, no. I don't think so because uh, if I'm grabbing the apparatus brand, it comes solely uh, alone. And then I have to, uh, unless it was already, you know, sort of detached, like in this uh, case that I mentioned that we removed the uh, uh, cortical vitreous and hyaloid for Tarsum syndrome. So the, the IRM was kind of loose like that, but not usually, not usually. I prefer to do them separate. I don't usually remove the apparatus membrane and it comes with the internal limiting membrane. And uh, then, because I like to do them separate, so I, I do the thing in the good fashion, you know, the, the movement around the circular and make sure that I remove the ILM from all the uh, macular area. Sim, sim. Yes. Queria saber a é, experiência dos indianos sobre o ponto de operar a membrana epiretiniana em termos de visão, se eles operam com a visão 2040 uh -huh. ou se eles esperam um pouco mais. Ok. Uh, Jadip, Carlos is asking your cut off for yes. uh, doing the surgery 2040, 2050, more or less. What is your cut off? You wait. A little longer, you go for the visual acuity. So, yeah, so I I was like, what I do is I'm following up the patients uh, uh, every three months, or if it's a stable membrane, every six months. And I I was looking at the visual acuity. If it is less than 20 by, you can say 60, like 618 vision in on the Snellens. That is the threshold where I decide to operate, but it also depends on the OCT. So on the OCT, as you said, I look at some of the factors like the ellipsoid zone and the uh, traction, the uh, mm -hmm. okay. isos junction, the, those okay. areas. And the visual acuity, visual acuity is uh, one of the factors which I was giving it importance because if the patient is asymptomatic, he's not symptomatic, or not complaining, then I would wait for a patient to become 618. But if the patient becomes symptomatic, I would rather, even at 20, 40, I would still decide to operate if the patient is symptomatic. Carlos, ele se 20, 40, né? É, e tá, assim, já começa a ter sintomas mesmo, 20, 40 é o cut-off dele. 20, 40, 20, 40, okay. he operates. Thank you for the Thank question. You. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So, Nicole, do, Nicole, do you want to ask any question? Could be in Portuguese, if you will. Nicole is our retinal fellow as well. And uh, Nicole and uh, Jessica. Jessica is not here today. She's on vacation. And uh, Nicole and Jessica and uh, the other Carlos, they are so good. You know, they are got too much to do in, uh, in practice. It's very good we have this service and getting back to normal JD because those COVID times, you know, the cases, you know, people waited a little longer, but now things are getting back to normal. And uh, we have here also Otávio Santos. Ot Otávio, do you want to ask any question? Quer fazer alguma pergunta? And uh, I think, I think that's about it. JD. Do you want to uh, uh, give any comment or Ashwara so that we, we close? I'm sorry, I was not able to uh, answer your question earlier. Actually, I participated for most of your presentation, but there was an emergency case in the OPD. So I got caught up with that. But whatever I heard, it was really good. So the videos also were really good. Uh, thank okay, you for that chance. Right. I wish well, I was are, not You're recording uh, by Zoom as well. So, uh, I'll be watching that in detail again so that I can uh, get, you know, uh, like, right. because now I was very distracted uh, when I was watching, so. Okay, okay. Okay, Ashwara, do you have any, we have to decide on uh, next week's cases and uh, maybe. Yeah, sure. So we'll talk okay. later today and uh, we'll fix up the next week's class also. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody, for participating. It was a great discussion. 
And uh, it's always good to be with you. you. I like when we discuss and we talk and uh, we keep uh, uh, moving on like that because uh, it's good to... Dr. Hudson, I, I just, just had one, one question, last question. Like, uh, suppose, like, it's an individual surgeon's, uh, you know, what confidence a surgeon has. Suppose uh, you may feel that you can operate on a eye which is even 20, 40, 20, or, you know, 20, 30. How do you, uh, what would you tell for somebody who's beginning, somebody who's a beginner, like suppose Aishwarya finishes a fellowship and then she starts operating apparatal membranes. How would you, in her practice, what would you, you know, tell her? Yeah, I, as I saw, uh, as I, I said in my comments, if you are starting vitrectomy, go slow. If you have a lens, avoid the lens. If patient is pseudo fake, avoid touching too much on the IOL, be extra careful. If you have an IOL and you have uh, the patient uh, was operated quite a while ago and you have posterior uh, capsule opacity, you remove the posterior capsule so you're going to see well, very uh, much better, your epiretinal membrane when you are starting. And so the good thing is that you have the media clear. So if you have a lens, which is not a uh, cataract, so try to spare the lens. If you have the uh, intraocular lens uh, hazy because of opacities of the posterior capsule, go towards the posterior capsule and clean it up in the center. You have a very good view and, and uh, go, you start with the wide angle lens, take care of the vitreous first. Vitreous, vitreous, core vitreous, start uh, uh, on the core vitreous, and then don't make, uh, you know, movements very fast. You go to the periphery, one side. If you have the patient, if the patient has the lens, you switch hands and uh, go the other side. Go everything very slowly and uh, uh, try to avoid iatrogenic breaks, but not going too peripheral. You just take, uh, do vitrectomy wherever you see the vitreous. So it's important to see the vitreous. Even if you have to zoom it in, zoom it out, the microscope a little more, a little less. And so if you see the vitreous, and then it's going to be cool. You're going to have a great surgery. And then before starting the macular work, the apparatus membrane, even if it's a good outcome, membrane never starts at the foveal area. It starts start elsewhere. Do an FLU exchange. Uh, uh, use the brilliant blue, for example. And if you see it, start grabbing the membrane from uh, uh, the macular area, but far away from the fovea. And then if you lift an edge, take your time, take the macular lens again, use a very good uh, tip, a very good, uh, for example, end grip uh, forceps. You go after the membrane and lift it up, go uh, horizontal, like following the, the round, uh, the, uh, uh, track and uh, never pull it forcefully. Do everything very slow and then you can get away with uh, any case. Very good. If you start slow with time, you're getting experience and things are going to get faster and better, but there is no need to show or to rush on those cases. That's my Thank advice. You. Thank you. Is there is there any role for do you do you use uh, uh, like post surgery as you said in one of the cases there is some edema residual edema that remains so do you wait for it to go or uh, have you injected something like uh, uh, like some methadone implant or something uh, given an intravitreal steroid post surgery yes not immediately after the surgery but it could be an approach. Okay. If the patient had surgery, you could right after surgery inject. That's not a problem. But I like in some cases, for example, if the macula is raised, like the case I, I showed you, I like putting some gas, even though the gas is not very expensive, just uh, some concentration to keep it up, keep it in their uh, uh, vitreous uh, cavity. So as to push, uh, to, uh, push on the macula, so to get everything straightened, so I wouldn't mix gas with injection at this time, but uh, uh, in that special case, after the patient 
uh, had everything removed, but still remained some edema. And then I would inject. I would do uh, antiangiogenics, and if it's necessary, if the edema gets chronic, and then I would uh, uh, choose uh, Orzodex, for example. And uh, so it depends on the cases. But most cases with the vitrectomy and removal of the tractum, they uh, go well with uh, uh, this edema. And uh, edema gets, uh, gets better over time. How, how, how often do you inject right. these patients? So that's what I, I have. I inject, uh, injected very rarely. But uh, there are some of these, as you said, very uh, high traction. They don't go down so fast. So it takes quite some time for that retina to settle. Or sometimes there is a the foveal contour doesn't come back in some of the cases. So is there any role for this uh, giving intravital steroid? That's what I wanted to know. Yeah, no. I have injected in few cases, but not not much of a benefit. I had thought. No, I, I after I. I start seeing patients and uh, if they still, there is still edema, I don't see there is a rule. I just start with the drugs and uh, if they don't uh, resolve, and then I could switch to the corticoid, which takes uh, longer, then it's a matter of a chronicity of the edema. But usually the edema resolve. They resolve if you don't have more tractons and uh, that's no more history but then if you had these uh, changes structural changes in the easy uh, uh, easy zones and uh, uh, cons cost areas of those distortions and uh, a longer edema for quite a while then that could out, uh, account for uh, the uh, worse outcome worse prognosis but these patients that remain or keep with uh, some post-operative edema I keep injecting them, and uh, edema usually, if it does not go away, gets better. I think uh, we, we should have more and more of those cases to, to learn with, uh, uh, right. with the case. Right. Anything, anything different in case in pediatric age group, uh, epirental membranes, anything different surgically that you do or... How you decide? No, no, except it's a little, probably a little tougher, no? That probably the membrane, right. membranes are uh, more attached, but uh, I would treat in the same manner. Uh, good thing is to have good uh, preoperative uh, imaging. And uh, if you can do that, and uh, even though it's a pediatric patient, if you have good uh, angels and uh, images, it's good. I, I have done uh, surgeries for a patient with a toxocara. It's a, it was a boy, four years old. I operated him uh, 20 years ago. Uh, actually, 24 years ago. He's today. He's uh, 24 years old. And uh, uh, he, he was starting this apparatus membrane and traction. And I toxocarisis, secondary to toxocarisis. I did the surgery. He was right, four right. years old. Yeah. I spared the lens. The patient is uh, uh, still... Uh, he was uh, a little amblyopic. He was already four years old, but uh, he's 2050 with uh, 24 years old today, but uh, with a clear lens. With a clear lens. Great, great. He never developed a cataract. <laughs> it's an interesting case. So I think nice. if you, uh, if you uh, operate on the case very early, as you said, and with a good right. indication for the surgery, it's going to be, be just well. Of course, we have to remember the PVRs we commented on and uh, the uh, middle cells and uh, other uh, potential problems. But uh, if we get these cases early, so I think that's the best way to go. Great. Thank, thank you. you very very much. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great discussion. Uh, uh, thank you very much for everything. I would like... Uh, once again, to show you this. Uh, Thank you again, Mr. My pleasure. Thank my pleasure. You. To show you again, I will finish with uh, this uh, video again for the Red Awesome. The next uh, Saturday is going to be very good discussion from Natarajan, from Vibeheb, 
from uh, Nakeswar and uh, all other friends from other countries, and uh, I invite you to to this event. Sure, that's, that's great. Wish you all the best. So, uh, J. Deep, thank you very much. Thank you. And, thank uh, you. Maybe you could participate in the early future in our network Nassau. That will be honor for us. Okay? Definitely. That will be great. So, bye bye. Thank you very much for everything. And uh, see you guys uh, next. Have a great day. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye, Nicole, Carlos, Otavio, J. Deep. See you later. Thank you. See you next week. See you next week. Bye-bye.